what we're going to do today, what I hope, is to arm you with some information. Some of this may be uh, information that you know. I'm hoping that it's organized in a way that's immediate and accessible. So you can listen to it in different ways. If you're a, a clinician, I would hope you'd listen to it in the way of thinking about how you go back to the children that you take care of and take a closer look at their individual ed plan and make sure that the emotional needs of the student are being met. Because we're really good oftentimes in individual ed plans writing for learning disorders and what needs to happen and sometimes we have a harder time building in very concrete steps for kids around individual ed plans. If you're a parent, a foster parent, or I want to meet your daughter, she sounds absolutely <laughs> stunning rich. Uh, if you're a foster parent or a parent, what I want to do is to provide you with information so that you can come into a team meeting, which I sometimes think is an oxymoron because it doesn't always feel like a team meeting when you walk in there. It feels like you and the rest of the world at a table and you have to be super brave. But I want you to have a little more confidence that you understand some of the terms and that you can not that you can be empowered to make demands. Because that is what we have to be, as Rich said, we have to be demanding that our children get the best that all of us can give. Because if you have a child, like you talked about, who has had 10 different foster placings, which is even hard to conceptualize, you wouldn't even bother unpacking if you knew you were going to the next place. How do we build a foundation for these children? So. It's a whirlwind tour, but that's some of what I want to be able to talk about. So, first I want to start with two stories. Aaron, and many of you, how many of you all work in high schools? So, you'll recognize Aaron then. Aaron is the kid who's got his head down on the desk. And the teachers come in, and they are really exuberant, because they have a lesson plan. It's maybe Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, uh, something equally as exotic. And they have put a lot of effort into making this an exciting lesson plan. And Aaron has his head down on the desk. He's got his hood over his head. And the teacher, in exasperation, because she said Aaron's name three times, and she's a good teacher, but it's just, you know, it's not nice on a Monday morning to have someone sleep before you start. And she raises her voice. Or maybe she taps the desk, and he has a startled response. And he wakes up, and he bolts for the door. And maybe it's a teacher who puts her arm out because she doesn't want him going out into the hall because she knows when he goes out into the hall, all hell's going to break loose because maybe he's going to bang the locker. But he's in a fight or flight response. And he barges through her, her arm to get out because he's flooded. And then, Sometimes I've seen in districts, you now have an assault and battery charge because you've had a, uh, what can be perceived as an assault, even if you have a teacher who doesn't want to pursue that. Sometimes districts have policies that require that. And what, um, Jane, you didn't mention, my other hat is doing safety assessments for uh, kids where principals or teachers have had these kind of events and we're trying to think about how can we mobilize to increase the safety net for this kind of child. But my dream is for us to have taught Aaron kindergarten through eighth before they show up into ninth grade the kind of emotional self-regulation that would help him move away from that fight or flight response. I have another small little girl that I wanted to share a story about, and her name is Liz. And Liz is asked on the first day back from school on vacation, write about a favorite moment that happened. Well, Lizzie, the, day be the night before and probably six nights before that, was hearing her parents fighting and drinking going on in the home. And uh, DCSF as well as a job. And I thought, where's our DCSF person? Because my hat goes off to you, because you have such a hard job. But DCSF didn't have 
enough information to be able to mobilize and get in there and make the kind of changes that sometimes we think may need to happen in this kind of situation. So Lizzie shows up in school, and when she's asked to do a favorite moment, she crumples up her paper and just dives underneath the desk. And these are our children. We all know them. So I'm going to move into saying, let's, let's think about holding each one of these children, holding a child the kind, when you hear me saying this, that you might have said, oh yeah, Joshua, oh yeah, you know, whoever that child is, hold him as I'm talking and think if any of these suggestions may be useful for you to build into an individual ed plan or to advocate. Before we do this, I want to step back and have us think about those children who have been traumatized. And one of the things that is so hard that DCSF is faced with is, look at this, with 890,000 child victims per year in the country, 564,000 of them are with neglect. And then you have the, 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 the difficult part that DCSF has is they, yes, we can give reports, but they have to be able to substantiate what's happened. So oftentimes, when kids land into your foster care, they're going to most likely have had to have physical abuse or sexual abuse, which is a small proportion of children who are being abused. But the neglect, in my mind, the neglect is just as insidious. It's just as evil, not that the parents are evil, many times they're doing the best that they can, but it, it means that when a child asks for what they need, they're most likely not going to get it. So when they're in a school setting and they're faced with a confrontation and maybe they have a learning disorder, it's absolute panic because they don't have the confidence. And that's why I say to you, regardless of what I'm going to talk about with FBAs and all that, the relationship is inherent in building an ability for a child to slow down. So just because uh, I am a medical doc and I like pictures, I just want to tell you that if you look at a three-year-old child's brain who's experienced significant trauma, and this is usually before children are verbal, they have experienced a flood of cortisol, a flood of adrenaline that shapes the architecture of their brain. To me, that is so sad because it means that their brain has, it's the internal part of the brain, it's the hippocampus, it's the amygdala, it's the emotional grand central station of their brain. And that area gets dwarfed. So what's important about that and it's true when I've worked with children for 23 years. And as you heard, I had a certain trauma with an enormous amount of support when I was four years old of losing my mother to suicide. And I'd like to think, even if I have a shrunken hippocampus and amygdala, that I am capable of emotional regulation. So I don't say this as the kiss of death to kids. I really don't. I think of it as the way we think about learning disorders, the way we think about attention deficit disorder, which is there are structural changes that may have happened in the brain, but we're going to help these kids figure out how to accommodate, how to be able to be competent. So just a brief what trauma's impact on learning. Memory, <coughs> big thing with trauma. You can't build a narrative that well. It's been interrupted. Writing, writing takes exquisite. It's amazing. It's close to walking or other exciting things that we do. It, it takes a lot of coordinated effort that often gets derailed when kids have experienced trauma. And then of course classroom behavior as I started out with the beginning. What I would say is many times what I worry about with trauma 
is that sometimes parents or schools may hook into the trauma and forget the underlying learning disorders that may be present. And we know from studies that if you address the underlying learning disorder, the classroom behavior is much improved. And probably what happens is the kid feels more competent, so they're not going to see as much of that kind of derailed <coughs> classroom behavior. And then key impact on learning is relationships. And uh, the ability to trust an adult is undermined. So I'm going to start with another uh, brief story about Ashley. Ashley was a girl that I uh, met when I worked in a residential treatment center and I was running a group for kids who were on medication. Who, so you can imagine, just imagine how hard it is when you have to advocate for a child to be in a residential setting and what the kinds of trauma of these kids. And I was running a group and it was right before the holidays. And Ashley was a large girl. It was about eight kids in a room with an exit that wasn't close to me. And she grabbed a light bulb. Grabbed a light bulb that she had in her hand. And I was not about to try to tackle her. Um, I don't even know much about football. But <laughs> that was not an option. And what I did was... I took a deep breath and I said, it looks like you feel like the world is falling apart. And she just dropped the light bulb and um, sat back down. So what kind of principles can we take away from that? Well, you know, the first is misbehavior is a symptom. That's something that... Uh, um, Carl Rogers said, and uh, is, oh, no, I can't remember who, which really smart person said it, but still, <laughs> <laughs> we said it in our book. Um, so, um, but I think that often can get lost in a crisis, um, really. I mean, you know, there's a story that one of my colleagues told me of a girl who was sitting in the, um, near the no peanut area, and she started to throw um, peanuts towards the no peanut area where the lunch kids sit. And you can look at that, right? And you can make a lot of interpretations about that kid. He's, she's sadistic. She's, she's going to grow up to be a, you know, a mass murderer or something. You can make lots of ideas about it. Well, the background of it was that um, her mother was mentally ill. And this was, a, in some ways, a metaphor for what she was experiencing and things being wildly out of control. It doesn't mean you say that's okay to throw the nuts there, but what it means is you may approach the child in a different way if you're curious. And that's why we called it the behavior code, is this idea of really trying to emphasize being a detective and, and, and staying curious, which is super hard, as you mentioned. When you are exhausted and depleted, it is very hard to stay curious. So. And but as I said, behavior is a communication. I think what got me out of what could have become a total nightmare was trying to make an interpretation of the behavior. And what I would say to you is, you don't have to be a child psychiatrist to do that. You can make a leap, and many people, I have worked with amazing paraprofessionals who are just so street smart. And they can rely on their street smarts to make an interpretation. And even if you're wrong, that can diffuse the situation. You know. And uh, the other thing is that the only behavior we control is our own. And that should be a mantra. That should be a mantra that should be like a bumper sticker on cars when you're stuck going home today. <laughs> and, um, there's a Yiddish saying, you can't control the wind, but you can adjust your sails. Mm. You, know, you can't control the wind, but you can adjust your sails. And the other aspect is, behavior can be changed. Now that may seem obvious. <laughs> I hope it is. But it's not, actually. When you, and I have worked for many years, with teachers who come close to being clinically depressed. 
when they have a very aggressive child. I think many of you who are teachers can probably look at your years and say, that was a good year or that was a bad year, and that the quote unquote bad year is defined by one or two kids where you're desperately trying to make interventions and they don't seem to make a difference. And what uh, Seligman talks about in his book, Learned Optimism, is that depression happens when you think it's permanent and it's pervasive. So one of the key roles, the key role that you are playing, each one of you in this room, is that you're communicating to children, to parents, to educators, to administrators, that this behavior, although it seems like it's never going to change, is temporary. And that, in and of itself, is a huge gift. I have had the blessing of having kids come back to me 10 or 15 years later to let me know that it was temporary. But for all of us who have been in this work, when we are in the hair-raising part where you wake up in the middle of the night and your stomach is twisted, it doesn't feel temporary. And what I know and what I tell parents is if you have that faith that you can make a difference, as you mentioned, and you are willing to keep trying, even when you're just going through the motions of trying, it makes the difference. So part of what I'm going to do, and I have to make sure I don't overdo my time, is, um, is to, have, to keep having tricks in the box. And to also know the element of time. Because I also think for any kid who's been traumatized, it takes 18 months to make a difference. So that does feel like forever, if you're a teacher, for nine months. But 18 months is the time that it takes for secure attachment with a baby and their parent. So 18 months is the number you should hold on to, where you may start to get predictable behavior. So for your grandson or daughter, grandson who had 10 different transitions, 18 months is a life year. And for DCSF, I would say, if we can figure out a way to scaffold kids so they can get to those 18 months. I like this analogy. I think it's a good analogy to use with folks. I used to carry around soda cans, but that got to be kind of intense. We tried to find a soda can at 8 o'clock. So we have a visual, right? And this is the idea that a lot of times people will say, where did that come from? And there's an element of surprise. And actually, there's an element of betrayal. Because if you think you have a relationship, and then a kid does something really stupid or really offensive, you feel broken down, right? So I think the soda cane is a nice analogy because it's saying that when a, child, when, when a soda cane is anxious, you, it's been shaken up. You don't know, right? You look at the soda can, you can't tell. And I think that uh, um, kids who've been traumatized are masters at masquerading. That is what they do best, because to be vulnerable is the kiss of death, sometimes quite frankly the kick of death. So they're not going to do that, you know? So, so I say anxiety is a hidden disability is the way we say that in Terms. <laughs> in clinical terms. So how can we help? This is probably the most important slide because I think this is what we want to see in every individual ed plan. In every, sorry to keep picking on you, you're going to be so sorry that you said you were from the DCSF, but I think in every, every service plan with kids who have trauma, we ought to have these skills be targeted and addressed with how we're going to help the families and the kids get to this place. So here's my golden slide. First of all, what schools love to talk about, how many of you have seen on an IEP self-regulation? OK. Um, it's, the, it's the hot button item right now. But I think we're missing a key piece there. Because I think what we want to talk about is co-regulation first. 
before you can get a child to self-regulate. You have to figure out how to build a relationship with them so they can borrow from you. But you are probably the teachers where the kid who's traumatized actually ends up doing decent and does okay. And if he doesn't, it's not your fault because if they've had enough damage, it's really hard to do. But, but that co-regulation is the make or break for a kid and is the bridge to self-regulation and sometimes we <coughs> skip that step. And it's what comes from parent attunement. All of us, how many of us have had children? Okay, so you know when you have a baby you're exquisitely attuned. You, you get a, a grocery list of what they need. And that doesn't happen many times for these children. So we want that first. The other thing we want them to le learn is thought stopping. Basically, how do they put something in a box that's going to derail them? How do they keep themselves from perseverating? So many times you have a kid who will go to the back and become mercenary to another child. And I do safety assessments, remember. And they will do some cruel things because they get stuck and they can't get over at an, a perceived injustice that's happened in the playground or because somebody's taken something from them. And it may come from a pervasive neglect where they need 500 pencils, you know, instead of the one pencil that you gave them. But we have to be able to equip them with how to do that. How do they get their, their mind to stop in their tracks? The other aspect is, um, is not doing catastrophic thinking. That's another, uh, we want to teach them about thinking traps. And um, there is a good syllabus called CAT, which is Coping with Anxiety, and I'm blanking on the name, but if you put in CAT, it'll pop up, which talks about the thinking traps and does a nice job for you know, third grade through eighth grade which, again, I think is useful for school counselors to be using. It's impossible for teachers to have to do, but the vocabulary is useful, and you can use it as a family member, so that you can, um, uh, I, I used to um, have my daughter, um, and I still used it with her, even now she's a junior in college, she's in India on an elective, uh, and she was nervous about a transition, and I said to her, you know, that's negative self-talk. And, you know, you can arm your kids to be able to recognize when they have catastrophic thinking, when they're thinking about on the downside, when they're magnifying things. And with social skills, what you want them to be able to do is to negotiate with peers. So a lot of the information that is provided for autistic kids, I think we need to just steal it and advocate for that, for having the same standard that we have for autistic kids, for traumatized kids, so that they have speech therapists that are teaching them social skills, which are very similar to some of the um, curriculum that's been developed for kids with autism. How to read someone's social cues, how to look at their faces, all the things that we are well greased to teach just need to be generalized, I think. And then executive functioning, as I mentioned. Um, I love Sarah Ward's ma uh, materials and all her in-services that she does, and I think they are directly applicable to uh, kids. And then the other one is flexible thinking. Getting kids to be able to recognize and celebrate when they show flexibility, because that is huge for our traumatized kids. Okay. So, so let's go into the fair plane. The first part is around function, and what uh, the what you'll hear about as a parent is that an FBA has been done, and um, I am of two minds of these FBAs. I think they're good, the functional behavioral assessment, because it does slow down the system, but I think we also, unfortunately, because schools are overstressed, have a little bit of a cookbook happening here, but I want to give you the language that many behavioral analysts are using so that when you hear it in an individual ed plan, you'll feel like, oh, I heard that, I know what's going on, and let me see if I can navigate through that and still be able to have the vocabulary about emphasizing building a relationship and what are the key ingredients that go into that. Don't get derailed by the FBA because FBA often does not comment on the relationship between the teacher and the student. And that 
is pivotal. And it doesn't always comment on what supports a teacher needs to be able to build that relationship. And that's where you can help. You can support teachers by having, by as advocates, knowing a way to say, well, how does it, if you think a relationship is important, if Robert Pianta's work on banking is true, which is that if a teacher has 10 minutes a day to have individual time with children who have problems with relationships, it can make a huge difference. How does a teacher in a poor district find the time? So you can help by putting some legislative teeth into what the request you're making. So the four functions are um, in, in the behavioral analyst world are sensory. So there's basically saying all of us are motivated by these four things. Sensory, looks good, tastes good, feels good. Tangible, they want it now and can't wait. All of us have had that experience. Attention. And the big thing with attention is, unfortunately, that's the biggest place where we'll start to say that a kid's being manipulative. And, you know, um, what my co-author Jessica says is that negative attention is fast and predictable and efficient. So kids who have been in neglect have figured out if I do something to really piss my parent off, they're going to come out of the stupor and they're going to respond to me. So we have to, as an educational nation, as a family, of na a nation of families, we have to figure out how we can shift that kind of, of, of behavior. And this is just to say that you know, in, in your, if you're in a classroom and a kid throws a chair, that becomes a major event. Kids are, are evacuated from the classroom. Uh, a major classroom meeting is, and I am not advocating for kids. Please don't get me wrong, I am not advocating for kids throwing chairs. But what I would say is um, that what we want to front load is how to keep this from happening, how to look at the antecedents and front load the individual ed plan so that this is, the, this is not a common occurrence in classrooms. So how are we going to front load? So again, I'm showing, I'm trying to reach a range of audiences. Some of you may not be recognized this, but this is what's a, uh, um, what, the, what behavioral analysts call an antecedent analysis or a behavior chart. So it's looking at the setting event. So that might be that little Johnny didn't eat breakfast or the kind of events that I was telling you about that you might know about. And then antecedent, what happened before, the behavior, and the consequence. So that's classically what you're going to see. There's a couple things I want to tell you about. Many times in schools, what you see the primary focus on, and I can say this having done literally hundreds of safety assessments, unfortunately. I want to be put out of business so badly. Um, is the focus is often on the behavior. And you get unbelievably detailed information about the behavior. And you know what? It's not very helpful. The magnifying glass on how two kids pummeled each other is not useful. Where the money is, is the antecedent, what was going on before. And that's when you're in an in a, in a educational meeting or you're in a meeting with a principal where you're being given information about what happened. You want to ask about the antecedent. You want to say, I, it would be very helpful I see that you, you know, first of all, you want to ask for an incident report. Those are available by law. You can get them although they'll have to white out the name of the other kid. Uh, but sometimes they'll say, we can't give it to you because we can't give you the name of the other person. And you say, fine, that's what white out what you want to do. And then what you ask for is to understand the antecedents, because many times there are significant antecedents. And some of them may end up being that it happens every time in reading class, or it happens because of where the kid was sitting, or it happens because this is a classic one there was a substitute teacher, okay? So if there are substitute teachers, and we know that little Johnny is not going to make it with a substitute teacher because, what did I say about before? Co-regulation. And so when Max nudges Johnny, he doesn't have the reserve to look at the teacher and realize that he's not under attack. 
because it's a substitute teacher, and some substitute teachers are wonderful, but others are really like a body in an empty suit or an empty suit in a body, whatever that is. You know, they're 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 really not equipped to support our kids. So I would say sometimes I fantasize, but if we know that's true, because really bad things can happen when you have a substitute teacher, maybe we have to put in our IEPs a special section for when substitute teachers come in. And maybe that's a day that little Johnny doesn't go to music class, because we really don't care if he learns the trombone on that day, if it's going to really derail the school and make it so impossible for him to function that day. Eventually, we want to get to that point, but maybe you know, we'll have to get there. So another thing, classic, is unstructured times. That's a huge um, place where disasters happen. So when you're looking and advocating for your children, you want to be very mindful about what is happening during recess and what is happening during lunch. Because God bless the lunch ladies. Some of them are amazing. Really, I'm serious. Um, but disasters happen during lunch and recess, and we want to be able to ramp that up. Many a study has showed that if you could take the time that you took to de to discipline around a recess event and actually put that time into supervision that happened in recess, it would be useful. Transitions, as we talked about, writing demands, social demands, and novel events and unexpected change. This is just to say that another place that you can add into the individual ed plan is around transitions, and that many times kids have problems with stopping and getting uh, out of a non-verbal and providing like a yellow sticky and figuring out at the end of a reading assignment where it ends is very helpful. And, um, uh, and then recognizing that there's a lot of lack, uh, lack of structure in the transition and many times going down to the cafeteria or the lunchroom takes 11 minutes to do if you time it. And so having activities that kids can do can be the make or break about whether they actually get down to lunch. Um, having a fidget bag that has some of their favorites. Previewing tasks we all know about, but a tip to, this is a Sarah Ward tip, but I think for those of you who are parents, um, what taking a pic, what a kid thinks they need to look like and what you think they need to look like are two different things. And um, having a picture on the refrigerator of what you want them to look like when they're younger, having a picture in the knapsack of what things they need to think about putting in the knapsack and making it like a luggage tag, these things can be make or break in terms of struggles around transitions. Um, emotional thermometers are used a lot. What I would say is if you're going to have an emotional thermometer, it's really helpful if you can get the whole class to use it. It destigmatizes it. It's a good educational lesson for all the kids in the classroom. And you can then have strategies that are next to it. Because face it, all of us are going to need an emotional thermometer at some point in our life. And it's nice to have those strategies. Another piece that I would say is for traumatized kids. They can't read their body signals. So you, before you use the emotional thermometer, you need to prep them and be able to give them some cueing about how it is that you as a foster parent or you as a teacher know that they're about to lose it. Because that's the co-regulation piece. And that can be a big relief. Another thing I think, again, that all kids could have in the classroom is a comfort box. Some people like to call it a calming box. I've renamed it comfort box because I think calm is a four-letter word for kids with trauma. So this is a comfort box I made with a kid. It doesn't have to be expensive. It can be a cardboard one. And what we have here is a, um, I don't know the technical word for that, but that's a cootie catcher. Um, and it's um, a good form of distraction. Um, and you could have something like Play-Doh, which is good for uh, touch, if they need different ones. This is just briefly to say having writing strategies is Again, you want to have concrete strategies that um, work for kids. And many times, particularly in high school, we have had kids that have built up so much fear around writing tests that you really want to break down the different things. Is it that they are exquisitely, it's problematic because they have so much anxiety and what they have to recognize is starting the activity is the hardest thing. So maybe 
what you do is you provide them with photographs to jump start them, to get them moving in the right direction. Maybe you start with a recording so that they talk about what they're going to write about and then they play it back. There's lots of different ways and I will let you. Um, and then with younger kids, what you want to do is have them identify the things they're good at, the things that they don't like about writing and the things that are okay. Because again, when we were talking about thinking traps, kids can get very polarized. I hate writing. And what you're working at is trying to get them to differentiate. The last piece that I'm going to talk about is relationship building, because you know I'm harping on that. And something that makes a huge difference is random acts of kindness. I can tell you from having gone through my own experience, random acts of kindness are what sustain you when you're going through a traumatic situation. It's somebody who makes the extra effort that's not responding to what you're able to do, but who you are. It's it's the teachers probably in this room, and it's the foster parents in this room, and the clinicians in this room, who may take a drawing of Tom Brady that's in every globe and say, you know what, I gave this to you. I, I was thinking of you this morning, and I wanted to give you a picture of your favorite football player. You know, something like that that really can make a turnaround. Because I often found when I designed an advising program in a high school that kids went on lockdown if they think a teacher hates them. That's when they are out of their emotional circle of fairness and justice and kindness, and you've got to get yourself back in there if you're going to make any progress. So I think we should write in to every DCSF service plan and IEP that we encourage the adults in their life to do random acts of kindness. And the other thing I think is very useful is the idea of pace. What I love about it is the idea of being playful. And that when we are up against a wall, it's the least time that we want to be playful. And I had a story, I was in Poland, my book randomly got translated in Polish, and I went on a Polish tour. And uh, it's amazing to think that kid behavior is, uh, I don't know what the right word for non-denominational in different countries is, but not basically that kids have a universal language. And one teacher gave me a beautiful example of sexualized behavior in one of our chapters is on sexualized behavior, which, believe it or not, is hardly ever written about. That's like a taboo subject for educators, even though that's what derails us. I'm going to stop in one minute, I promise. And, um, <laughs> and uh, what she did was uh, she had seventh graders, middle schoolers, and she left the room for a minute, and middle schoolers left to their own devices during the transition time decided that drawing a penis on the wall was, I mean, on the chalkboard was a fun thing to do. Ask a Polish translator to translate penis. It's really <laughs> and um, uh, she comes in and she says, oh, I didn't know that you are interested in cacti. Just diffuse the situation. You know? So it's useful that to put you know to be to think of the cacti next time when you're in a really tough situation. <laughs> um, pausing is another big one. You know, it's the idea of taking a moment to go in and breathe or make funny faces of yourself in the mirror. That's courtesy of Liz Jurgensen, who's a wonderful clinician. And um, the one thing I would say about giving demands, and again, I actually think we should write this into the IEP. Many of us who are in education and many of us who are parents are conditioned to ask our kids to do something with a question. Would you like, and ending with a question, that is not good, okay? If there's anything you take away, do it in a neutral tone, don't ask it with a question, provide choices. You can be in the red or the blue chip chair, but not, would you like to be in the blue chair or the red chair? No, I don't want any chair, and now you're screwed. So you want to, you know, it's the cookie principle. So that's it. I just want you all to, to take those things. Take those things. Oh, no. I, I, have, I have to share with you one last thing. I know I'm completely breaking all the rules, but that's my thing. I asked a woman who had been a foster child, multiple foster, well, foster placements, to reflect on what made a difference to her. And she gave me permission to share it, and I just want to tell you really quickly what she said, because I think it's uh, important for us to return to 
the children that were taken care of. And what she said was, <clears throat> stop gazing at traumatized kids as specimens. Before engaging, individuals should conduct a reflection of oneself. Look deep within the crevices of the heart mind where painful memories are stored. Face your pain, forgive others, release it into the universe. Restructure each situation into learning tools, useful for mental, spiritual, and physical growth. Thank you.